We celebrate Mass today on this 25th Sunday of Ordinary Time. The Mass is offered for the repose of the soul of Veronica Houghton, who died recently. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and prepare ourselves for these sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King. O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who founded all the commands of your sacred law upon love of you and of our neighbour, grant that by keeping your precepts we may merit to attain eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he is still to be found. Call to him while he is still near. Let the wicked man abandon his way, the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn back to the Lord who will take pity on him, to our God who is rich in forgiving. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways not your ways, it is the Lord who speaks. Yes, the heavens are as high above earth as my ways are above your ways, my thoughts above your thoughts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
A reading from the letter of St Paul to the Philippians. Christ will be glorified in my body, whether by my life or by my death. Life to me, of course, is Christ, but then death would bring me something more. But then again, if living in this body means doing work which is having good results, I do not know what I should choose. I am caught in this dilemma. I want to be gone and be with Christ, which would be very much the better. But for me to stay alive in this body is a more urgent need for your sake. Avoid anything in your everyday lives that would be unworthy of the gospel of Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner going out at daybreak to hire workers for his vineyard. He made an agreement with the workers for one denarius a day and sent them to his vineyard. Going out at about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, You go to my vineyard too, and I will give you a fair wage. So they went. At about the sixth hour, and again at about the ninth hour, he went out and said the same. Then at about the eleventh hour, he went out and found more men standing round, and he said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You go into my vineyard too. In the evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his bailiff, Call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with the last arrivals and ending with the first. So those who were hired at about the eleventh hour came forward and received one denarius each. When the first came, They expected to get more, but they too received one denarius each. They took it but grumbled at the landowner. The men who came last, they said, have done only one hour, and you have treated them the same as us, though we have done a heavy day's work in all the heat. He answered one of them and said, My friend, I am not being unjust to you. Do we not agree on one denarius? Take your earnings and go. I choose to pay the last comer as much as I pay you. Have I no right to do what I like with my own? Why be envious? Because I am generous. Thus the last will be first, and the first last. The Gospel of the Lord. I think you would be probably rather shocked if a friend or acquaintance came and said to you that they had only married their spouse because they knew that eventually they were going to inherit a small fortune, or a person who admits that they've made friends with you because they think it's going to help them in their social climbing or their career path, or a soldier who might say that they only went to fight for their country because they believed it was going to improve their chances of having a political career. Such relationships could be described as calculating and mercenary. Because a true relationship is not one that is predicated on how much one gains from the other, 
And I think you could confidently predict that such a relationship would fall apart fairly soon. Marriage, friendships, patriotism are not commitments that are undertaken for their own sake, not for the benefit that one accrues by entering into that relationship. And that is why the litmus test of a true friend is that we would be willing to give our life for our companion. A true husband, a true wife, is willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of the other. A true soldier will die for their country for no reward. Because if you're willing to give your life for someone, then clearly you're not expecting to get anything out of it. And in a mysterious kind of way, you have transcended self-interest. When a couple commit to each other in marriage, what they're saying is that my life is not about me anymore, it's about you. Each one pledges to the other, I'm not in this for personal gain, I'm in it for you. And the wedding ring has that symbolism. As the ring turns, it's like the wheel of fortune, because in the course of married life, we're going to experience everything together, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. I pledge my very being to you. The readings that we've just listened to are all about that great principle in relation to God. The Bible constantly warns us against entering into a merely mercenary relationship with God. That is to say, a friendship of convenience or self-interest. Now, someone who's immature, or maybe someone who's a little bit naive in the spiritual life, might say to themselves, I will love God so that all kinds of benefits will come to me from that relationship. Because if I love God and do what he wants, I'll be protected from illness, or I'll live a long life, or maybe my enemies won't get the better of me. Maybe I'll be rich and successful, and I'll have lots of warm spiritual experiences. But this is a mercenary kind of relationship with God. There's always thinking, what am I going to get out of it? Now just go through some of the great biblical heroes and stories with those thoughts in mind. Is it the case that Job, for example, who is utterly devoted to Yahweh and followed his law to the letter, that he is protected from illness or disaster in his life? On the contrary. Is it the case that Abraham, our father in faith, always had warm spiritual experiences, who never had deep struggles. Just read about the account of the sacrifice of Isaac to get the details. Was it true that Moses, arguably the greatest figure in the Old Testament, someone deeply in love with God, never experienced sufferings or hardship at the hand of his enemies? David, the psalmist, the good spiritual leader of the people of God, the beloved of Yahweh, did he never have any difficulties in his life? Quite the contrary. Just read those stories sometimes and think to yourself, you know, ask yourself the question, does love of God always accrue to my personal benefit? And I think you'll see that the answer is a pretty resounding no. So it's strange that supposedly many religious people, even those in touch with the Bible, fall into that trap of thinking that friendship with God means keeping suffering and hardships at bay. There's nothing in the Bible that justifies such an assumption. Because the Bible is not interested in cultivating a mercenary relationship with God, but rather cultivating a true friendship whereby we fall in love, not with his benefits, but with him. We can forget every other tenet of theology and of spirituality so long as we remember that basic principle 
that true friendship with God is falling in love with him and not with his benefits. There's that amazing line in the book of Job that says, Though he may slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he may slay me, yet will I trust him. You could spend an entire life unpacking and reflecting on that sentiment. Now, we might think that's extreme, but think about a truly devoted husband or wife who may well say to each other, my love for you means so much that I might even have to die for you. Wouldn't a soldier say, I love my country so much that I may have to die in her service? So the question in the spiritual order is, do I love God simply for his own sake and not for any benefit that will come to me from the relationship? If I can say I love him in that way, then that is a sign that we have reached real spiritual maturity and adulthood. Now, I hope the application of all of that to the gospel today is obvious. That famous and upsetting parable of Jesus in which all of the workers are paid the same, despite the protests of those who worked a full day in all of the heat. Those men who complained were in a merely mercenary relationship with the landowner. They did what he wanted only because they would get the certain things they wanted from him out at the end. We must never be in that kind of relationship with the living God. When we find ourselves complaining as they did about injustices and about some people getting more and I'm getting less, it proves that I've not fallen in love with God but rather with his benefits. The essential but hard question is, how precisely do I, do you, love the living God? Is it like one of those reluctant, begrudging labourers in the vineyard, resentful of those who have been treated better than they have? Or is it like a saint Or like our blessed mother Mary, who loved God with an unconditional heart. Praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us, men, and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For us, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Receive with favour, O Lord, we pray, the offerings of your people, that what they profess with devotion and faith may be theirs through these heavenly mysteries, through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, For you so loved the world that in your mercy you sent us the Redeemer to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might love in us what you love in your beloved Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours, that by sinning we are lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks, as in exaltation we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit. Graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, He said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, we proclaim. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by his death, he will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, our spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. 
pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Alan, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who have left this world in your friendship, who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours, for ever and ever. Amen. At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord. For those who are joining this Holy Mass remotely, spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. The body of Christ.
let us pray. Graciously raise up, O Lord, those you renew with this sacrament, that we may come to possess your redemption both in mystery and in the manner of our life, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So a couple of things I'd like to mention. Could I ask you to take time just to look at the guidelines for Holy Communion, which you find on the website and in the newsletter each week. It's just important that we all try and do the same thing when we come to Communion. And although the way of receiving Holy Communion at the moment is far from ideal, it's far from what we would wish, at least if we all try to do the same thing, it guarantees not only uniformity, but also the utmost reverence for the Blessed Sacrament. The other thing I'd say is because we're not having bidding prayers during the Mass at this time, because we're trying to keep the Mass a bit shorter than usual, um, please don't let the sick people and those who have died recently um, go out of our consciousness or fall off of the radar of our um, prayer lives. You might look each week at the sick in the newsletter and those who have died recently and please remember to pray for them because I know there's a great number of sick people who are housebound or in homes and they follow the mass here remotely each week faithfully and they depend on our prayers and I know that they're praying for us and they're joined with us in this way uh, so please keep them very much in mind even though we're not specifically praying for them by name during the mass as we would normally do above all I wish you a great week ahead the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go forth, the Mass is ended.